Thanks everyone for being here today. Uh, super excited to talk to you about things that I've found to be true in building a culture that supports open source and open ways of working uh, from the bottom up. So what I've got for you here today is a presentation that's a little more than a half hour, and then we'll leave the rest of the time for questions and discussion. Uh, so as we go along, just feel free to put questions in the Q&A uh, part of the Zoom call, and then we'll have plenty of time to get to them uh, at the end. But don't feel like you have to wait till the end. Just jot them down as you're going along, and if it's not something that's answered as we go along, we can talk about it at that point. All right. Uh, well, Regina gave a bit of an introduction already. Uh, I'm the uh, secretary and a, a board member at the Intersource Commons Foundation. And the Intersource Commons is a, a, a foundation uh, dedicated uh, toward uh, spreading, uh, uh, spreading open source culture and open source ways of working, but to company internal software development. Uh, this is something that I've had experience at, uh, at multiple Fortune 100, 100 companies. And it's something I'm really excited about. I think like over the last 20 years, we've seen like the rise of open source go from something that's a hobbyist to something that's uh, developing the most impactful uh, software in the world. Uh, we've realized that open source is kind of the gold standard about how to run a very, very highly impactful, widely used project. Uh, the things that open source projects have had to figure out in order to get uh, effective collaboration also have a ton of lessons for us to learn uh, in corporate software development. Even if that software uh, never ends up having uh, something that goes open, open source, uh, uh, a software company of any size is gonna start running into all the same problems in its internal development that open source projects have already solved in their ways of work, working, specifically around like managing and balancing the needs for many, many consumers of software to get, to get what they want, all without um, not being able to meet up at a given time time and place. So just applying those lessons learned from open source to company internal uh, software development, uh, that has the name inner source. And that's where this uh, term uh, comes from, you know, we use in the name of the foundation, the inner source commons foundation. So this foundation, here's the, the logo, this uh, Taurus here on the screen is the logo of the foundation. Uh, the purpose of the foundation is to encourage the teaching, the spread, the adoption of open source way of working in internal software development, to encourage the adoption and successful training of inner source in the industry. Uh, so to do this, there's a few things that the foundation offers. Uh, there's a Slack channel that's going 24 seven. I see some people on the attendee list, uh, they've already found that Slack channel. So it's, it's good to see uh, some of you here. Uh, so that's a place to connect with other inner source practitioners in the industry to discuss best practices, uh, ways of working, or to just say hello. Uh, the Commons, inner source Commons, also has a GitHub location where we document patterns, practices, and training around inner source uh, to share in a cross company manner. So we're building uh, inner source uh, research, learning, and training, and we're doing it via the same methods that we're encouraging others to use. We're doing it via these open source methods. Uh, so there's that GitHub location. And then the, the third thing that the Intersource Commons off offers is multiple every year in-person summits. Those are like small conferences dedicated to the subject of Intersource and how to bring that open source methodology, that open source way of working uh, to our company internal development. So this is about all I'm gonna say about the foundation, but you can find more uh, here at our website at intersourcecommons.org. Uh, and for the balance, I'd like to talk uh, about some of the lessons learned through my own experience and then listen to others that are participating uh, in these areas that are organized by the foundation. Uh, we have over 150 companies that are engaging in some way with the, the Intersource uh, Commons. And as I've listened to their stories, uh, there's a, a there's a lot of commonalities. So I'm gonna share some of those uh, conclusions and observations that I've had. Uh, first of all, uh, there's a pattern to the types of projects that make sense within a company to run in this fashion, to run as an open source project inside, uh, you know, projects that make sense to run as inner source. Uh, so, so one aspect is when there's a project that has many, many internal customers and these customers 
have development resources. Intersource can be a really good fit. These are the platforms that software teams around the company uh, generally tend to be platforms that software teams around the company use to complete their daily work. Uh, we're talking about things like continuous deployment, continuous integration, and resources and projects to make that happen. Uh, with a company with a lot of UI work uh, in mobile or on the web, web uh, shared component libraries that allow teams to implement the company style guide throughout all of its assets. That's another example. Uh, API standards, making sure that API sets are consistent, both internal and external APIs. Tooling for managing interaction with the cloud <clears throat> and uh, how that works uh, for teams across the company. Uh, and then even for the API sets and services that represent the company's uh, business data, uh, those APIs themselves can be broadly used and adopting an inner source uh, fashion and manner uh, toward uh, toward managing the, those API services uh, can make sense. I, I remember one example at a company um, that did a lot of financial transactions and the checkout API service was one which teams around the company had a lot of high demand for changes. The team just wasn't staffed to meet them all. And so they shifted toward running their API service as an inner source project and companies that needed changes in functionality could contribute those via pull requests and unblock themselves without waiting for the team to prioritize their particular scenario on the roadmap. Uh, so that's an example of what I mean of running a business API service uh, as, as an inner source project. And the, the commonality here is that when you get enough internal customers that are spread far enough throughout the company, traditional ways of organizing work break down. Uh, many of us may have uh, participated in some form of of agile uh, scrum with sprint planning, maybe a scaled agile framework that groups different teams together and scrum of scrums. All these are designed to facilitate cross team dependencies and communication. Some of these platform services, they have so many internal customers and consumers that there's never going to be some kind of top down orchestrated synchronous scaled process that's going to be able to manage and plan for all those dependencies. What do you do in that case? How do you figure it out? Well, open source has already figured that out. There are these software projects. We saw the logos earlier in the presentation. Uh, they're used around the world by people in different time zones with very different needs. And the open source way of working, anyone can open an issue. Anyone can open a pull request. People are up leveled you know, through to be committers and maintainers. Uh, this process works inside the company too. And this is inner source. This is how we take the next step uh, that agile or scaled agile can't quite bring and scale these projects to meet the needs of all the internal customers. And this helps us to solve a, a problem that some of you may, experienced, may have experienced uh, in, your, uh, in your company or in your business where there's duplication of projects, uh, multiple projects at the company that are solving a, a, a similar need. Uh, this is also a very common story. Uh, Intersource can help with this. No one wants to make a duplicative projects just because they think it's fun or they think that theirs is better. It's just that the first project that then gets duplicated, it's having trouble scaling to the set of consumers that want to use it through these, these problems I talked about earlier. Uh, applying intersource, applying these open source methodologies allows projects to scale more broadly throughout the company. Uh, so there's not a need for duplicative projects. Everyone can just use, use the one. And, and this, is how, this is how I got started in this area in intersource. Uh, I was working on one of these platform projects. Uh, it was a continuous delivery project for uh, websites at the company I was working on at the time. Uh, now we needed to solve this problem of how we scale uh, very, very early because we didn't have a lot of funding to do what we needed to do. Uh, a lot of the emphasis was on uh, backend API services and a continuous delivery of websites was kind of an afterthought. Uh, and so uh, we formed a development community where multiple uh, squads or teams could contribute to a shared repository for their deployment needs. Uh, this was the beginning of our inner source project. And over the next two and a half years, with very, very little funding and a very small team, uh, this became one of the most widely used projects at the company. Uh, at one point, we were able to get metrics and measurement around how it was used. And we had verifiably 90% of all commits going to websites at the company were going to a repository that uh, used our project uh, for, their, uh, for their test and production deployments. 
Uh, so 90%, so virtual monopoly on market share. Uh, we didn't have any leader telling everyone that they had to work with us. We didn't have a large staff or funding or some, um, some involved scale planning process. We were able to adopt open source principles to this internal project. We were able to adopt inner source uh, to achieve this effect. And that kind of got me to my uh, job where I'm not now, things have evolved, but uh, now my full-time job is bringing about uh, inner source inner source behavior. And I, I found, and this holds true at other companies that have participated in the inner source commons also, I found that this is uh, really a culture change. So uh, a lot of the balance of the talk, we're gonna talk about uh, culture and what it means to change culture. And I love this quote from management guru, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, inner source and a move toward inner source is really a change in strategy. Uh, but that strategy has to sit in a culture that's going to support it. Otherwise, that strategy is going to get eaten up for breakfast. Uh, so there are some points of culture that need to be there in order for inner source to work out is we need a culture uh, at the company where this approach is being tried. <clears throat> we need a culture uh, that supports both in word and then also in action that supports things like uh, contribution, gratitude, transparency, meritocracy, asynchronicity. And for those who have worked in successful open source projects, these things probably aren't a surprise. They're the same thing that a successful open source community needs to thrive. Uh, those need, also need to be present um, for an inner source project to thrive. And the problem is that a, a lot of ways that uh, are structured at companies to get work done uh, by default, uh, don't necessarily embody all of these traits, whether intentionally or not, just in practice. Uh, many companies have cultures that reward things like uh, achievement, self-promotion, uh, things are opaque. You know, there's opacity is kind of the default rather than transparency. Uh, influence tends to come by uh, formal position or organi organizational hierarchy, and things get done by uh, meetings. And all, all these, you go point for point, uh, all those that I called out fly in the face of the type of culture uh, that's gonna bring about a successful inner source. Uh, so that's hard. So if, if you are considering adopting an inner source strategy, uh, you need to think seriously about the culture and at the same time as promoting an inner source strategy, also be working to promote and foster the type of culture that's gonna make it successful. And what we're gonna talk about here in the balance of the talk is some examples and some metaphors uh, to align on how to think about going and doing that. Uh, it's gonna be a little different at every company. It's gonna be different at the same company in different parts of the company, but these principles that I'll teach will hold true. And they've, they've held true for me for years as I've talked about them with others over the years, they resonate, they hold true as well. So I wanna go over those and commend them uh, uh, to you. Uh, so I'm going to start with a, a picture here of how I think about culture change. Um, culture change is, is, is hard. And in this picture, we have a picture of this cement slab, <clears throat> cement slab and sidewalk. And, uh, in this, I want to compare the slab uh, to your company's current culture. Uh, it's flat, it's smooth, it's big, uh, it's hard, and it's really, really solid. Um, and in order to put a, a crack in that, uh, to execute some change in it, that's gonna really take some doing. Yet here in the picture, uh, look at it. There's a crack that's gone through this seemingly a hard, solid, totally unbreakable thing. It's got a crack in it. Uh, how, how did it crack? You know, what finally was able to get that thing to crack uh, here representing the, the culture? Uh, was it a jackhammer? Was it a, a sledgehammer uh, and chisel? Did someone go and hit it from the top until it finally gave under the pressure? Uh, no, that wasn't it. You can see behind, it's, it's the tree. It's the tree and the root going from the tree has grown slowly, imperceptibly uh, day by day and become so powerful, you know, that root has been embedded so firmly uh, that that slab had no choice uh, but to break under its growth. And I, I can't emphasize enough the importance, and we'll, we'll talk about this as the talk goes on, 
uh, the importance of setting down roots of something new that sink into the ground and grow so powerful that they break the breakthrough, uh, the culture that's that's currently there. This is the way to think about culture change, setting down roots, helping them grow uh, as opposed to a top down mighty crack. Now this idea and approach to culture change in a corporate situation is not unique to bringing in inner source. It's not even unique to the tech industry. There are established patterns of how to go about doing this in a corporate environment that have been wonderfully uh, documented here in this book, uh, More Fearless Change by Mary Lynn Manns and Linda Rising. Uh, I can't recommend this book uh, highly enough to you if any kind of culture change initiative is part, uh, part of your job, inner source or otherwise. Uh, the things here uh, work for all. Uh, this book is especially uh, useful because it's organized into a set of self-contained reasonable patterns uh, around how to effect change uh, in, a, in a corporate environment. Uh, each of these patterns at the beginning, they'll list the prerequisites that if they're necessary, this pattern could be useful to you. Uh, and they're short, they're three to five pages. Uh, so you could just pick out one particular pattern that addresses a problem that you're solving. You don't have to go and read the whole book. It can serve as a wonderful off the shelf, uh, five to 10 minute resource for you. Uh, the patterns, the prerequisites are clearly documented. The patterns are summarized very succinctly and all of them are accompanied by real world examples that show how the pattern is played out in an actual situation uh, in a way that makes sense and helps you imagine how this pattern could help you with whatever you're facing. Uh, so I can't recommend it more highly. Uh, a lot of what we've done has been in here, sometimes um, sometimes in intentionally, and sometimes we've been uh, going with a particular strategy around introducing Intersource, and uh, we've uh, subsequently gone back and read this book, and we've seen, oh, you know, that, that pattern describes what we we're doing. You know, yep, that, that works pretty good. And then other times it's been more proactive. We had a particular problem, been able to crack open this, this book, uh, find something and try it out. And then sure enough, it works. Uh, so I won't go into everything in here. I'll have to leave the book with you to read. But I do want to list off some of the patterns that are in here that we found to be very useful. And they have catchy short names that kind of give you an idea of the types of things they do. So let's list off really quick. Uh, we've used these patterns of uh, uh, testing the waters when trying something new. Uh, finding and cultivating early adopters, uh, breaking through stagnation and just doing it, uh, giving sincere gratitude to those who participate. And when we talk with folks, making sure we leave a really personal touch with those we're trying to influence. Uh, we've sought out and continue to draw in corporate angels to back up what we're doing. Uh, uh, made sure that becoming a dedicated uh, champion is uh, you know, part, of the, uh, part of our job at the company. Uh, found ways to involve everyone who's supported, uh, while at the same time giving each person uh, just enough of what they need. Uh, to clear the way before us, uh, we've uh, we spent time in uh, corridor politics, and there's also uh, many, many more. Those are just a few that have uh, found useful to us. And uh, I want to summarize uh, a, a on the next page a, a picture that I think draws in a lot of key aspects that we've talked about already. Uh, and setting down firm roots and, uh, and aspects that are supported by all these patterns. And again, I want to do it with a picture here, a picture of a tree. And we're going to form a metaphor for introducing inner source uh, or any culture change uh, through exploring the parts of this, uh, this picture, a newly planted tree. Uh, so first of all, the, the visual part of the tree, the trunk, the branches, uh, this represents uh, inner source behavior, inner source activity. Now, right now, it's just a small tree. It's just something that we hope grows. Hopefully, one day it'll have huge, you know, metaphorically huge towering branches with uh, lush green leaves uh, and tasty fruit uh, that all can enjoy. Uh, but in this, in this picture, we're just getting something planted. Now, I think just from the metaphor of a tree, it becomes very clear that the soil the tree is planting in is, is very important. And in this metaphor, I'm going to say that represents uh, what we've been talking about, the current culture uh, in your, your company where you want to see inner source behavior. And it's very clear that for the tree to live on and grow, that culture has got to be conducive to that behavior and activity. So it's just a visual point uh, on what I was trying to, what I was trying to say, say earlier. 
Now, uh, sometimes it's hard to know, I don't know, like, is the culture conducive enough? Uh, the way you're going to know, the thing that you can observe is as you start to teach people about inner source, uh, do you see people voluntarily adopting or voluntarily participating in the new behavior? That um, activity is example of um, the culture being conducive so that roots are naturally being put down, okay? Uh, so voluntary participation in a resource, that's the roots uh, here in the metaphor. And it happens when the culture is conducive to the new activity. Uh, now, I re uh, what happens a lot of times is you know, maybe culture isn't so conducive. And after teaching others, people are having a tough time getting started. Uh, maybe you've seen this in some other culture change initiative. It's just not quite going well, even though, uh, even though the desired behavior has been communicated. Uh, so when that happens, people try a strategy that I think is analogous to actually planting a live new tree. And you've probably seen this before. Uh, if there's a young sapling that's just getting started, that is just getting going and can't really stand up to the elements on its own, it's a little unsteady, what we might do to strengthen it is to put something that is strong, that can stand on its own uh, next to it in the ground. And then we tie, uh, we tie that tree to that solid thing so it can reinforce it as it's growing. And the most, uh, we got this example here in the picture, you, you see the kind of the wooden or metal rods. And I think all of us have seen this around trees, you know, maybe growing in a city somewhere uh, that are young. Uh, in this example, the most common thing that I see people tie uh, this new behavior inner source to is leadership advocacy. Uh, the leadership structure is already strong, already solid. It already stands on its own. Uh, let's let's tie inner source to that. Let me get people get the support of leaders. Have leaders, uh, people's um, leaders, senior director, vice president, CTO, whatever. Uh, tell them how important inner source is, and they have to participate. Right. So metaphorically, it's like tying it to that solid post, and that may help things to to stand for a time without falling over. But in this picture, I, I think it shows is very key that that needs to be a temporary measure. Tying it to something else just gives it time for the roots to go down and get solid. It, the, tree, um, the tree isn't meant to stand forever tied to this rod. In fact, the idea is that uh, the, the rod is one day taken away, the roots have been set down, the trunk has been made solid, it stands on its own and it grows higher and higher, higher than it ever could if it needed to be propped up by something so small and simple as a rod. Uh, that's the goal. And you know, with the physical tree, I think it's very obvious. Uh, metaphorically, it, when introducing a culture change, it can be very tempting once that change has been tied uh, to leadership advocacy to stop and say, hey, this is standing on its own. That's it, we've done it, we're successful. And neglect checking on the roots to see if people are voluntarily participating on the new behavior or if it's only standing because of being tied uh, to that metaphorical post, you know, being tied to leadership advocacy. Now, this is so important because uh, one day or another, that leadership advocacy is guaranteed to go away. It's happened every single time uh, that I've heard of this shared in the inner source comments. And logically, it just makes sense. Uh, leadership advocacy and leadership time and attention is a scarce resource. And these people have a lot coming at them, a, a lot of important things that affect all, all sorts of aspects of the company. Uh, it's just a matter of time before there's some kind of change in focus where that scarce resource of advocacy isn't able to get put toward your activity of inner source anymore. Uh, or even before that happens, uh, as frequent or maybe more frequent, there's going to be a change in leader. Uh, there's going to be some reorg or a new vice president and is going to be hired. Uh, something is going to happen where there's a new leader that comes in. Uh, so one day or another, that supporting post is going to be taken away. And if, if your new inner source activity hasn't taken root, it'll, it'll fall, over, uh, fall over at that point. This is so important. Over the last three years where I've been working in this area, uh, uh, my own leadership change, there's been, uh, I've, I think my direct manager has been swapped out seven different times. Uh, but because what we were doing had voluntarily participation and it was taking root, uh, our work toward inner source has continued basically un uninterrupted. Uh, again, it's because of focusing on the roots, uh, because of focusing on making sure that people are voluntarily participating. Uh, so 
Let's talk a little bit about voluntary participation, again, with another picture and how to think about, uh, you know, like, okay, that sounds great, uh, Russ, but, but how, do we, how do we go about doing that? Uh, let me give a picture that give principles around voluntary participation, now that we've talked about, about why that's important. Um, okay, so uh, here's the next uh, picture uh, that I use to think about this. Here I've mapped out a coordinate space uh, and I think there's some le lessons learned here that can uh, give us a frame of mind of how to think about it. Uh, so in this coordinate space, uh, uh, this uh, represents um, a team's uh, way of working, way of developing software. You know, like maybe they use a Scrum or Agile process. And the, I, I've represented a, a team or a person uh, by this stick figure that's here, here that you see on the slide. Now, let me point out the other aspects of what I've drawn on here. Uh, first of all, we have the vertical axis. So this, this axis uh, represents the effort that it takes for this person or team to develop software in this manner. Uh, so there's uh, some, some effort involved. For example, I keep using the example of Scrum or Agile. There's different ceremonies. Uh, excuse me. There's different ceremonies that are involved. And uh, sometimes, I don't know if you do, I hear uh, developers and engineers kind of gripe about that sometime, like, oh, so many meetings in Scrum. Why can't, you know, why can't we just code? Uh, so they're recognizing the fact that there is some effort involved there. Uh, but there's also some benefit uh, as well to that. And uh, here that's represented along the horizontal axis, uh, the benefit that this person or team gets by putting forth this effort. And I think, again, back to the this kind of canonical example I've been using of Scrum and Agile, I think people believe that uh, although there's some effort to be put in, uh, there's, there's clearly uh, cl clearly the benefit as well. So it's worth doing. And I, I kind of marked that kind of hypothetically, theoretically with the word uh, current uh, on, the, on the graph. Let's suppose that represents you know, this stick figure engaging in a, a standard Scrum or Agile process. And you can see it has some vertical and then it has some horizontal um, a dimension to it. So it takes some effort, but brings some benefit. Now, uh, an in, in, inner source or kind of bringing in open source methodology to your project uh, is, a, is a new way of working, a, a new way of working. All of a sudden, I'm going to be potentially submitting pull requests to a repository that I don't own, but because I need a feature there, there may be other people at the company that are submitting pull requests to my repository, and I've never met them before. Uh, so that's something new, and that's going to take more effort. Uh, if you've been involved in successful open source projects, uh, you may have felt, as I did, uh, that you kind of get familiar with the effort after a while and it's something totally manageable and reasonable. So maybe it takes a little bit more effort. And I've represented that here on the slide by the word new. You can see it's like it's a little higher up, uh, a little higher up than the current position. So a little bit more effort. Uh, but the benefits, and I talked about some of these earlier, kind of widespread adoption, like deduplication, people can unblock themselves. And those benefits are huge. These are really common complaints of developing software in a large enterprise. Uh, so having a way to, to, in a scaled way to, to, to take away those complaints, huge benefit. Uh, so again, to represent that, that word new is, is pretty far to the right on the, on the slide. So a little bit more effort, but a, a lot more benefit. I and mean, this seems like a no brainer. Let's, let's do it. Time to, time to inner source everyone. Um, and uh, the problem is, that uh, in practice uh, for a person or for a team to migrate from their current position to the new position, it's not necessarily a straight shot. Like I just hop over there. In fact, a lot of times the migration path follows a curve like the squiggly line that I've drawn. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm being kind of nice by saying it's a curve. Like it's, like it's like a mountain, it's taller than that person is. In fact, if you could imagine our stick figure kind of like walking along that curve, uh, very quickly, uh, you know, looking at the axes, very quickly, they're gonna be expending more effort for very little increased benefit. Um, you know, can, you, can you see down on the curve, kind of the steepness of the curve? A lot of initial effort uh, without really getting a lot of the benefits. In fact, if we all were to put on our kind of imagination hats and imagine ourselves like going into the slide here, imagine yourself with your head and eyes at the position of the head of that stick figure, you can see that the mountain of effort in front of you is so tall that you don't even have, uh, metaphorically, you do not even have line of sight where you can see the new position where you're gonna, gonna arrive at. And let me, let me circle that. Yeah, that, that's the mountain we're talking about. I don't even have line of sight to see the new position, how great it's gonna be. Uh, so while 
all of us here listening to the presentation are, are so excited to spread inner source way, way of working. Uh, and from our vantage point, we can see how great it's gonna be for this stick figure. Uh, for them, it just looks like a lot of work without a lot of benefit. And in this situation, uh, this might be the type of situation where there's some pushback and people don't wanna make the change. And again, if, if you've been in a, a corporate situation where there's some change in initiative that's been announced, uh, maybe you've seen this effect before. There are some people who are very excited for everyone to make the change, but those who actually uh, need to put in effort are not as excited about it. And I don't, I don't think that anyone is being difficult or short-sighted. Uh, I don't think that uh, anyone kind of isn't, um, for some reason, you know, can't see or can't understand. It's just we have a different perspective, right? And you, you can kind of empathize with this this person. Uh, so what, what happens a lot of times in this situation, I see people do it for inner source too, is when there's resistance to making a change. Uh, from our vantage point, again, we can see how great it's going to be. So there's this thought that says, well, uh, I know, I know how great this is and how much everyone needs it. Uh, let's, let's put in energy and kind of uh, encourage and force the people to make this change. Let's force them up and over that level of effort because in the end, it's, it's for their own good. And uh, that, that's something that you can you can do. This can come in the form of extrinsic rewards for those who complete the change. Uh, it can be uh, management or social pressure on people uh, to encourage them to to make the change. Uh, but the problem with that is is it takes energy, and it's energy that goes into something uh, that that doesn't doesn't live on. It's energy that's expended once, and 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 that's tough because. Uh, if the change is successful on a small scale, uh, what gets asked? Uh, well, uh, that was great. You helped one. Uh, can you go ahead and help everyone? And soon that becomes like everyone at the company uh, uh, to help them make this change. And, and the problem is, is that if your strategy to, to help people to make the change is to apply energy at them, you have to scale up the amount of energy in order to get them uh, all up and over that hill. And when you want to go really broad, all of a sudden the resources it takes to come up with that much energy, you know, that much social and managerial pressure, uh, that many extrinsic rewards, all of a sudden you're back to needing that leadership advocacy as a, a key component of this change to be successful. As we talked about earlier, the minute that leadership advocacy goes away, maybe not the minute, uh, but eventually that leadership advocacy will go away. And if that's uh, the linchpin of the whole strategy, things will slide right back down the slope, uh, slope to where they were. Uh, so uh, what this principle of voluntary participation tells us uh, is instead of expending energy at the people uh, where it's used once and then gone, uh, and, and by the way, uh, which isn't very much fun for the people usually, maybe you've been one of these people where you've like felt some energy directed at you to make a change that's hard and that doesn't really make sense to you. Uh, that's not really fun for the people uh, at all either. Uh, so what this principle of voluntary participation teaches is instead of expending that energy at the people, let's look at the landscape and especially this hill. Like, like why is it there? Why is it hard for people to make this change? Why is there so much effort that they can't see the benefits of something new? And is that feedback for us on the location of the new position or how we're communicating uh, the change or how difficult it is to make the transition? And can we take that energy and then apply it to thinking about that hill instead, and then hopefully like like knock it down to where it's not as difficult to make the uh, to make that change. And and here again, metaphorically, if we put ourselves in the page of this picture, you can see that although there's some work involved, it's not as much as before. And especially a key is metaphorically, these people have line of sight to the new position and the increased benefits it'll bring. And it, as their friends migrate people that are at the new position are metaphorically visible to those at the current position, like further reinforcing the fact that they should make the change. And we're gonna talk about that reinforcement and the role it plays in, in just a second. Uh, but just going back to my example I talked about earlier of the continuous delivery project, uh, again, that eventually kind of got a monopoly at the company. Uh, we always took this approach and anytime we explained uh, that people should use our project for deployments and they didn't want to, uh, we always took that as feedback that in some way, maybe we even, we couldn't see it. There was some kind of mountain of difficulty between where they were at and where we wanted them to be, which, which in our case was using our project. And our goal was to find out what that was and get rid of it. 
Maybe we need to articulate better the benefits of working with us. Maybe we need better tooling. Maybe our continuous delivery project doesn't meet all their needs and it needs more features and functionality. And by adopting this approach, we always learn something, whether or not the person or team eventually came around and eventually came around and used our, uh, and used our project. Uh, I remember when I started, I communicated uh, this continuous delivery project and I was telling a friend, okay, we're gonna have a, a repository. Everyone around is gonna commit to it and, and give pull requests when they need help. And I remember my, my friend almost laughing and saying, uh, Russ, you know, no one's gonna do that. Uh, you have to get their director to tell them they have to work with you or they're just gonna go their own way. Um, you know, it's like applying that social pressure. And I remember thinking, and I, I still do think, I thought, you know, no way. Uh, I'm not going to do that. If they don't voluntarily want to use my project because it makes their life better, that's feedback to me uh, that I need to I need to improve. And and that's been a, a very productive way of thinking about it, which I think goes along with this uh, with this picture. And and this here we have you know we've gone over some uh, metaphors and pictures. Uh, anecdotally, they've held true for me, and also anecdotally for experiences that I've heard in the inner source comments. Uh, all of them uh, that I've heard at the summits, you know, they can all be thought of in this, this model. Uh, and also there's uh, some academic research that backs up this way of thinking. Uh, and this author, Dr. Damon Sintola, in this uh, book, How Behavior Sp Spreads, a uh, great book. I'm going to give you the, the premise because uh, it is a real read. Uh, but this, this subtitle uh, kind of sets the stage for how uh, Dr. Sintola thinks about the spread of behavior in a society. Uh, and this is society in general, but but you know a, a corporate uh, culture at a company that's an example of a type of society. Uh, so this subtitle can introduce us how he's thinking about it: the science of complex contagions. And it's uh, super interesting. It's kind of timely right now because we're like in the midst of this uh, global pandemic <laughs> where this you know contagion is has spread throughout the world, and that's actually kind of the start of uh, you know you wrote this several years ago, so he wasn't referring to the coronavirus. Uh, but uh, the, the spread of a communicable disease is how he starts explaining, explaining things. And he contrasts the spread of behavior to his, which he calls a simple contagion uh, to the spread of a, uh, of, uh, excuse me, the spread of a communicable disease, which he calls a simple contagion. He contrasts that to the spread of behavior, which he calls a complex contagion. Uh, so let's look at what this looks like. Uh, the idea behind a, a spread of a simple contagion uh, again, this could be a, uh, a common cold, or in our world, it could be the, the coronavirus, at least best as I understand it, this is how the coronavirus spreads. A simple contagion needs just uh, one person that's infected, uh, infected or that has, uh, has the contagion, uh, just one person to come in contact with others, and everyone with whom they come into contact uh, potentially is then infected or, or then has, has that attribute. Uh, so when you think about that in a corporate environment, say we have one person in the middle or at the top, uh, the CTO or CEO, uh, this person may have some direct reports. And because of this reporting relationship, we can say that they're connected in this, um, in, in this corporate culture. Now, each of these uh, direct reports, maybe they're managers and they all have their own teams. And uh, we'll say that everyone on the team is connected to each other uh, and connected to the manager because they all work together as a team, uh, work together as a squad. All right, now, uh, if the, the person at the top or in the middle has an, a new idea that they wanna spread, uh, if this idea spreads via the simple contagion model, it travels along this person's connection. So the, again, back to the corporate example, the CTO has a new idea that gets spread to all of this person's uh, managers and the managers, because they have the idea, uh, spread it to all of their teams uh, and everyone on the team. So everyone gets the new idea. Uh, Dr. Santola has modeled that uh, information tends to spread this way between people, you know, as well as communicable diseases. And uh, again, if you worked in a corporate environment like I have, you've probably seen this. There's some uh, big announcement or, uh, you know, a, a, new, a new CTO, uh, you know, new leader comes in and uh, where people have social connections, it could be among team bind dynamics, it could be other connections people have, that information spreads, spreads pretty quickly. Um, now, some people would like behavior changes to spread this way, uh, that from the top or from the middle, we could say, okay, we're gonna adopt an inner source culture and practice and behavior, and it would spread the same way, and then everyone would be working inner source. 
That, that's not the case. Uh, Dr. Santola has, uh, has shown academically, uh, you know, with academic rigor, that behavior spreads as a complex contagion. And what, what a complex contagion means is that one person that's uh, infected or, or hosts that new attribute, that new behavior, uh, excuse me, uh, one person is not enough to spread it to their connections. Multiple points of reinforcement are needed before a new person will adopt the new behavior. And kind of socially acceptable behavior is something that Dr. Santola has shown spreads this way. And in his book, he like calculates activation thresholds, like how many people around me do I need to be activated in order to adopt the new behavior myself? Is it percentage based? Is it absolute numbers based? And he goes through you know, case studies and, and, and so forth. Uh, but that's the premise. You know, one point of uh, one point of reinforcement isn't enough. Multiple points of reinforcement are needed. Uh, and, and again, in my situation, I've seen this. I think some of you have probably seen this too. Uh, maybe there's some big new initiative. There's some big new announcement. You know, okay, everyone, we're all gonna uh, head this way. We're gonna new, use this new tool, adopt this new process. Um, and if you're like me, you've seen everyone kind of wait a little bit. Like, uh, okay, uh, I heard what you said. Let me look around and see if my, are, you know, are my peers doing it? Do I hear the message again? You know, are we actually going to do it? Uh, again, uh, they don't know it, but they're, uh, uh, they're demonstrating this behavior that Dr. Sintola has shown. They're looking, where's my second, uh, or sometimes it's third or more, you know, where are my other points of reinforcement? Because a change of behavior is a complex contagion. Uh, so that, that is, is key. So we'll talk about how that plays out a little bit. And uh, as I said, this simple model, kind of organizational hierarchy, uh, does not represent all of the paths that exist in a corporation uh, for connections to be made. You know, there are people that know folks on other teams, whether in a casual or professional way. So the, the crux of having a new behavior that's at the center that is desired to spread is not to push harder at the center. Uh, we need to set up points of reinforcement so that new people can become activated with, with new behavior with source. Uh, so if we strategically kind of seed the graph with a few people that can become bought in, uh, that are already connected to each other, those people can reinforce the behavior in one another and being converted to the new behavior, uh, again, to the idea of inner source here, uh, they can then spread that influence among their connection. With that spread, there are now uh, new kind of nodes in our social network new people that have enough reinforcement to also become activated to uh, adopt and to try the, uh, the new behavior. And assuming it goes well and people actually see the benefits of an inner source way of working and continue to want to work that way, uh, they can then spread to their networks, more people can become activated and so on. Uh, and this is again, an academically uh, backed model of behavior change. All of the principles that I was that I've been talking about earlier, uh, uh, all the principles that I talked about earlier, they support this mode of of, uh, of activation. When you set down uh, roots and make sure those roots are growing, those roots form a web that spans uh, throughout and traverses the social or hierarchical networks that exist in your corporation at that company. Focusing on the roots and making sure that new of them keep growing. Uh, they grow close enough to each other where these connections can be made. You don't have to map out all of the connections and make sure that everyone has a buddy to reinforcement. Uh, if you create a culture where roots are spontaneously springing up, uh, maybe I should have brought in a picture of this, but if you see like a good root system, the roots are everywhere. You can't help but to have roots that are close to each other. So this reinforcement of, uh, of behavior, uh, behavior can happen. Uh, now, uh, I, I haven't, I haven't actually, um, I'm gonna, well, let me just do the sum summarize first and then we'll, we'll get to the teaser of what's next. Um, so I wanna summarize here, um, inner source way of working completely makes sense for these broad platform type software projects. We've seen it with hundred or more companies involved in the inner source comments. Uh, and it's a culture change. It needs to be thought of that way. Uh, we're not on our own in bringing about culture change in a corporate environment. There are documented patterns uh, that can be applied and work. And these documented patterns aren't just anecdotal. They are entirely consistent and backed up by academic research around how behavior spreads, how behavior spreads in a society. 
Um, so as I said, I'm gonna uh, wrap up here with my, my contact information. But what I haven't had time to do here today is assuming you're bought into this way of working, what are some specific things that you can do uh, to bring more open source uh, inspired practices into your company, uh, to bring more in more open collaboration that leads to an inner source way of working. Uh, so we're not gonna have time to get into that today, maybe a little bit in the questions we can talk about, uh, but uh, I will be, and I wanna invite you all, I'll be speaking next month at Open Source Lisbon and getting much more specific about categories of things uh, that you can bring in to move a particular team, a particular individual or your company uh, more toward the open collaboration habits that come from open source uh, and will yield robust inner source. So get much more specific around the categories of activities you can do and give a rubric for when they make sense to bring in. Uh, and kind of, uh, I don't know if we'd all pick uh, everything that happened to us this year, uh, but with the virus and everything being virtual, everyone can attend Open Source Lisbon. Uh, so I forget the exact website, but you search for it. It's probably opensourcelisbon.com. Or if not, you'll find it very quickly. Uh, you can go there. And I have a talk there where we kind of get to the next level of specificity. But assuming these principles are true, what are some categories of things you can do? And when do they make sense? Um, so we'll have some time for questions here. And uh, totally happy. And I'd love to meet and talk with you more. I want to invite you to find me on the Intersource Commons Slack. You can find an invite to that uh, on the intersourcecommons.org website. Uh, we can chat in Slack. Uh, you can email me, first name, last name at outlook.com. Happy to talk to you there. And then we also have time uh, for questions now. Uh, so thank you. And uh, if you have a question or, or if you don't, uh, if you have these last few minutes to take the time to fill out the survey, I would love to get your feedback on things that made sense or things that you want to know more about. Uh, so that as I continue to, to share, uh, you know, here and elsewhere, I can do the, the best job explaining the things that I've learned. Uh, so uh, copy the bit.ly link or get your phone out and scan the QR code, fill out the survey on your phone. Uh, I'd love to hear more and get your feedback. Oh, with that, thanks so much and have the balance of the time for questions. Hey, Russell. So thank you so much for a powerful presentation. We do have one question in the Q&A. Um, if you could look at that, you said small team and large company where 90% of commits go to the inner source repos. Can you share those numbers? This is coming from uh, Michael. Yeah. Hi, Michael. I think we might have met before at, at some point too. It's good to see you. Um, okay. Small team and large company. So our, uh, well, we started out with a team of, of, of zero. And with a team of zero and a volunteer development community, we were able to have uh, four projects. And that, that would be kind of in the, um, I would say in the tens of commits uh, a week. Uh, we did get a, a funded team. And for a long time, we were a team of uh, four people. That was our steady size. It was myself kind of ended up being the product owner and manager. Didn't do a lot of coding, but three full-time engineers they were about half and half between managing the community and then committing to the project themselves. And with the four of us and uh, a company of about uh, 2000 engineers, uh, we had 90% of those commits. Uh, I do not remember the number of commits, but there are 188 projects, I think out of 197, we're using our, our deployment pipeline. So uh, to, be, to be precise, 90% of projects we're on our deployment pipeline and then all commits to those projects. So I, I, I can't say you know, for sure how many would that be uh, every week. Um, you know, I, I'm guessing you know, somewhere, you know, somewhere in the range of a thousand or more. Uh, do I call out the next question and answer? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, we're kind of out of time. Let's see. Let's oh, see did I go time. to the end? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's 3.20 and I have to get ready for the next session. Um, oh, I thought we had till the half hour, sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, really quickly. So um, early in the talk, I was wondering on the leverage factor, especially since you mentioned activation size later. Can you elaborate yeah. on that for um, Michael's question? And his second question, can you share a bit of how that experience mapped to complex con contagion? Yeah, it sounds like Michael and I need to get some uh, time together. This is awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so so the key with uh, leverage factor, um, let me let me go let me go back to here. 
the, the key with uh, leverage factor and activation size, uh, I think a lot of it is a percentage of the mind share. The company can be very big, but if you can have a, a tight knit or a clique uh, set of, of reinforcement, uh, you can, uh, e even though 90% of the company has nothing to do with what you're doing, uh, in the world or from the perspective of the individual, from their world, uh, if you can occupy a significant percentage of, of their direct connections, that's what's important. So the other thousands of people, whether or not they're engaging behavior, it really doesn't matter. Uh, you know, this, this, this graph could be like totally huge, but if the five or six people that are most important to me, if two or three of them are engaging the new behavior and I'm finding value to it, it's enough. So leverage and activation size are really uh, relative to the particular node in the network that you're trying to activate rather than the total size of the network. And what we did was uh, we created a separate space for those participating to gather. We had a, a weekly meetup, four hours every Friday, where people who were in the development community would get together physically. And that uh, was a space whereby they could rem uh, we could maintain on purpose, we didn't know at the time, we were like intentionally maintaining uh, those reinforcement connections, whereas otherwise they might have died out. And because those reinforcement connections were maintained through the space that we set up, uh, people always had that activating input, even when they weren't getting it from being a part of their normal team. So we could have like one person on, on a squad or a team remain totally activated, even though no one else is, because we kept drawing them out into the meetup of others who were activated and they, they kept themselves hot and live, you know, while the behavior is spreading.